And hello again. I'm Luca Balzani, live from the Odison showroom. And I'm Ken Ward in Portland, Oregon. And this is episode five of our OEMpedia webinar series. And today's episode is based on selecting the proper bit processor. Let's start with the basics. Ken, what does DSP mean? Wow. When you said you <laughs> wanted to start with the basics, you weren't kidding. Okay, <laughs> just a minute. Um, in the electronics world, DSP stands for digital signal processing. And if, if you want to talk about digital signal processing, we should spend a moment and talk about analog signal processing. Okay. So this is an audio waveform, and we push speakers around to play music with electricity that looks like this if you look at it on a scope. And with analog signal processing, we're going to change the shape of the waveform. So one common thing we do is we make it bigger and we add energy. Another common thing we do is we take away energy and we make the waveform smaller. Sometimes we will flip it 180 degrees and turn it upside down. And sometimes we will delay it a little bit. So you can do those things with various electronic components and all of them have side effects. And let's talk about one that we all have experience with, and that's a passive crossover for a component speaker set. I think you have one there, Luca. Oh, yeah. Let me grab it. Here we go. Holy cow. That thing is huge. Yeah. Our, and it's also very heavy. Well, I'm going to put a picture of this up so that people can see uh, yeah. this without Luca having to carry thanks, it. Thanks for understanding. So this passive crossover network attenuates some waveforms. It takes some energy out of some waveforms and not others. So bass, if it's on the way to the tweeter, it will get attenuated. The energy will be taken out. And treble waves will get attenuated on their way to the mid-range. So these things are big, right? And the better they are, the bigger they get, the more they weigh, the more they cost to build. If you look in this picture, there's a lot of copper in this picture. And if you want to make these passive crossovers even slightly adjustable, they get even bigger and more expensive. So it's fair for us to say that if you take a passive crossover and you make it smaller and less complicated than this thesis passive crossover, that it has some compromises in the design. And this is true for almost all speaker crossovers in our industry because almost all speaker crossovers in our industry are smaller than this one. Now, we're going to talk about how to overcome the shortcomings of passive crossovers in a moment. But another way that we change the shape of the waves is with equalizers. And analog equalizers are really hard to do well because they can easily add noise. They can add background floor noise, and they can add electromagnetic noise from the car. And the reason that these things happen is because analog waveforms are very delicate and they're very fragile, and it's easy for bad things to happen to them during sound reproduction. And this is something that Audison has years of experience with because they make high quality amplifiers. So back in the 80s, I was taught never use the analog equalizers that our companies provided us because all of them damaged the sound more than they helped. Uh, so back then, if you were a sound quality competitor and you wanted to have a good sounding equalizer, you went and bought a studio equalizer that was built to very high standards, and then you modified it so it would work in a car. And then along came digital. So if you want to convert a waveform to digital, you send it to a special chip that's called an analog to digital converter. And all that chip does is measure the voltage of the waveform and it does it thousands of times a second, and it saves that measurement as a number. And that's where the digital comes from. And digital compact discs were the first digital commercially available uh, recordings that we could buy. And those discs contained the measurements from an A to D converter chip, and they were saved in digital form. So now we wanna play the digital recording. So we put the CD in the CD player. And now there's another chip and it's called a digital to analog converter. And what it does is it takes those measurement numbers and it creates a waveform that matches those measurements that were taken during the recording process. So 
digital signal processing doesn't change the shape of the analog waveforms. At least it doesn't do it directly. It's really complicated math using a lot of numbers very quickly. And it takes the numbers from the measurements and it changes them slightly. So it turns out if you do these calculations really fast, you can change these numbers before you send them to the D to A converter chip and it happens fast enough to where you really don't notice anything. And because there's math involved, there's a lot of ways to screw it up. But if you change the numbers before sending them to the rest of the audio system, you can make a lot more changes with much, much fewer side effects than if you were trying to do all this in the analog domain like we used to. So three things that we used to do in the analog domain that we can do in the digital domain now are controlling the levels, crossover filtering, and equalization. And you can even use all pass filters for phase processing. They used to be in the analog domain and now we can do them digitally. Um, another one is delay or time alignment. And as far as I can remember, uh, there weren't any analog delay devices that were made for car audio for using delay the way we use it now. Um, there were some for special effects, kind of like guitar wah-wah pedals for delay, but there, there wasn't anything for high fidelity. Um, so if you're in the digital domain, you can just take the numbers, put them in memory for a specific period of time, and then take them out at just the right time. And the best way I know to explain this is when you want to get your beer cold fast and you put it in the freezer, but you have to take it out at just the right time before it explodes all over the inside of the freezer. It's exactly like that. So digital signal processing refers to the chip. And I think you have a chip there, Luca. Um, here we go. So that's the bit one DSP chip, isn't it? Yes, it is a good site. <laughs> so digital sound processors, which you know DSP also stands for digital sound processors. And those are the products that we use in car audio that have those little chips inside. So back in the old days, I remember the first DSP products coming out for car audio. And usually they just did one thing. I remember one that was just for crossover filtering and delay. I remember another one that only did equalization. And I remember another one that was only for OEM integration and didn't have any crossovers or any equalization adjustability at all. Yeah, but then the legendary product came out back in 2008 and combined everything. OEM input dequalization, OEM input summing, crossover filtering, channel level control, and more. Channel by channel equalization, source switching with auxiliary and hands-free phone support, polarity inversion, groundbreaking fully digital signal path to the amplifier called full DA. Eight channel inputs and late channel outputs, but let me show an emotional video of this timeless milestone. That was really subtle, Luca. I have goosebumps, just to <laughs> let you know. <laughs> sure you do. Okay, so that bit one was one of the first processors to give us all of these tools that we almost take for granted today. It was really quite an achievement. 
Uh, yeah, and we think the Bit1 has been the most successful combination DSP processor for cars ever. With more than 50,000 units sold all over the world, as you've seen in the video. So let's talk for a minute about why it was such a groundbreaking product. What do we use all this DSP processing for? Well, the most important thing, and what we've been talking about in this webinar series, is to undo the processing that the OEM sound system is doing if that processing doesn't work for us. We talked about this a lot in episode two. There could be equalization. Nowadays, there usually is. Uh, it could be dynamic equalization that changes when you change the volume control. There could be active crossovers that limit the number of notes on a given channel. And there could even be phase processing. Now, the second thing is to compensate for cabin acoustics and for speaker locations relative to the listener. And I think this one honestly is undervalued today. Um, this is where DSP is really valuable even if you have an aftermarket head unit or even if you have an external preamp that deletes all the OEM processing. If you send a signal that is perfectly flat and unprocessed to a great audio system and then you install it into a car, the interior of the cabin and the speaker locations in that cabin are still going to mess up the sound and you still need to overcome that to get the best sound. So the third thing is some kind of control functions. And what do I mean by that? I mean some things as simple as switching from one tuning preset to another or controlling the master volume, uh, switching from one source to another, or even controlling the fade level from front to rear. So there we go. Yeah, and those are the three big reasons, right? And now, why choose right a bit processor? And uh, the first is uh, about experience. And since you are the first with the combination processor, we are the most experienced in this field. We have a veteran team of developers and we manufacture all our DSPs in Italy. We develop the firmware, we develop the software, we manufacture the hardware. This is a great advantage. And also we have a wide selection of bit processor and solutions. First, the B10, compact and powerful. Then comes the HA DSP. This is from Hertz, and we can call it the big causing of the B10, performing eight channels output. And then the classic and award-winning B1. We call it classic, as with B10 and HA DSP are using a graphic equalizer. And then we have the B Nova from the new parametric generation. And finally, the newest and most advanced bit processor, the Virtuoso. Virtuoso, it is in a class by itself. By the way, Audison also has four different bit amplifiers, which we have discussed in past episodes. Each has outputs to process signals to external amplifiers as well. Audison avoids making things too complex. Each bit processor has a setup wizard that walks you through selecting the proper input assignment. And output configuration is done from a map of the car. You click on the speaker, you have it in your specific installation. We do the equalization and summing for you, freeing up to do the tune. And we also avoid making things simpler than they really are sometimes. Step up to the bit virtuoso and you get 12 input, 13 output channels, parametric EQ technology, input deface correction, pass through mode for up mix it or phase EQ, finite impulse response or FIR optional algorithm eliminates phase side effects on the sound, up to 48 dB octave crossover filters, global input, and channel specific EQs. That is quite a list. It is. <laughs> some of you might wonder, why would you ever need a processor with 12 channels in? But I can tell you, we're seeing OEM systems that regularly have 10 or 12 channels or even more. Right. You can even go out today and buy a Honda Civic that has a 10 channel audio system in it. And Ken, would you walk us through selecting the right bit processor now? Sure, absolutely. So the three things that we're gonna to need to know 
in order to select a bit processor. The first one is how many input channels do you need? The second one is how many output channels do you need? And the third one is what else do you need? Hmm. So first, we're going to estimate how many inputs we need. Uh, why do you say estimate? Because we're not going to be absolutely sure until we pull the car into the install bay and take it apart and test the wires to see what signal is contained on each set of wires. But from a commercial point of view, we need to estimate this so we can sell the system in the first place. So let's talk about each of these three things. Now, in episode two, we talked about the six stereo presentations. And here's the list of the six stereo presentations. But if you missed episode two, you might want to watch it on the Audison official YouTube channel to get a full explanation of this, because we're only going to cover it very briefly. So once you know the stereo separate the stereo presentation that is being used by the factory system, you can decide which bit processor is better. And here is a list where I've sort of emphasized a few items for as being best for this application and crossed off a few items for not being appropriate. And there's two big things I want to point out on this list. Three of the six stereo presentations have a center channel. If you're retaining the center channel, you got to remember the bit 10 and the H8 DSP do not support center channel retention. So I've crossed them off the list. Uh, if you're keeping a center channel, you want to use something with more inputs than a bit 10 or an H8 DSP. The second thing to remember is that if you have a system with an upmixer, or if you have a system with phase equalization, you can upgrade using various bit processors. We've talked about that in episode two and episode four. Now, we've talked about techniques to do this, but the Virtuoso has a pass-through mode, and it's the ultimate tool for both of those scenarios. We'll talk about that, more, about that more in the next episode. Now, what else can we do at this point when we're designing the system before we've had the chance to take the car apart? So we talked about this in episode two. Count the speakers, look for badges, check for a center speaker, look inside the tone control menu of the radio to figure out what's going on. That's one set of things we should always do when we look at the car. You can also look up things online. You can pull a wiring diagram, you can Google the OEM system, you can look at configurator pages, and you can even go to Facebook groups like the Educar Integration Group. Now, here is a diagram of a base Honda Civic. And don't worry, this is not the 10 channel version. This is just the base audio package. And you can see there's four channels coming out of the radio and there's six speakers. There is no subwoofer. And since all the speakers look like they're the same size, we can expect they probably all have a full range signal. So the maximum number of inputs we would need on our bit processor would be four. And we can do this car with any bit processor because everything has at least four inputs from the input point of view. Um, also, by looking at this diagram, you can see there is no external amplifier. So we can reasonably expect the output voltage to be less than 10 volts AC. And that means all the bit processors can handle it. You won't need any kind of attenuator like an SLI 2.2. Now, you can look at this wiring diagram all day. It will not tell you if there is equalization applied to the signal. It won't tell you if it's dynamic and it won't tell you if it's fixed. Most of the time nowadays, there is equalization applied, but all bit processors have de-equalization built in. So it's not a big deal if equalization is present. Now the dynamic equalization, the one that changes with volume, that requires a new master volume control to completely overcome. And that would mean you would have to install the DRC. So we don't know at this moment if we need a DRC to overcome dynamic EQ. Now, if it's a premium European car, you can check the bit DMI application page on the Audison website to see if there is coverage. Yeah, and remember that you need a Toslink input to use a BDMI. So that's the Hertz H8, the Bit Nova, the Bit One, the Bit Virtuoso, and all the Prima Bit amplifier. The basic Bit 10 is not on the list. If you need to fade with the Bit DMI, you need the DRC. Oh, and by the way, this vehicle coverage will expand in the next coming months. Okay, so let's look at what we know now. 
we know the stereo presentation, how many speakers we have, if there's an amp, how many channels it has, if there's a center speaker, and what kind of settings there are on the OEM radio. So now we can look at this list and decide how many input channels we're going to need. If we look at the diagram and there are front woofer outputs on the factory system, and there's front tweeter or mid-range outputs on the factory system that are separate, that usually means active crossovers are being applied to the signal inside the OEM amplifier. Now, if the car uses normal stereo, you could sum channels back together, no problem. We've been doing that for years. As we talked about in previous episodes, if there is no center speaker and we determine that the car uses phase equalization, you don't wanna sum things together. So now we're going to talk about uh, how, how many uh, channels we're going to guess that we need. And if you use a device that has Toslink in, then it becomes really simple. What, what if you estimate low and you need more channels? Well, that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. And let's use the bit 10 as an example here. Um, if you've got a bit 10, you can configure the four channels a couple of different ways. You can use front only if it's full range. You can use front and rear. You can use front high and front low and have the bit 10 sum them back together. And you can have front and sub. But in this example, you need six inputs. You need front high, front low, rear. Meh, not going to work. We've <laughs> run out of inputs. We can't do it. So one of the things we could do at this point is we can use an SPM, a stereo passive mixer. And it will sum front high and front low inputs back together to two full range channels. And then we can run that into the channel one and two of the bit 10. So same thing here. If you have front high, front low, and sub, I'm sorry, front high, front low, and subwoofer, you're gonna need to use an SPM to combine two of those channels together to be able to use the bit 10 and still get all the notes. Now, you would get even better results if you upgraded from the bit 10 in this scenario to a bit Nove, but sometimes we're in a tight spot and the SPM will get us out of trouble when we're in a tight spot like that. It, it, it basically adds two input channels to any DSP, as long as you have high and low pass channels that you can sum back together. Um, this is especially valuable if you're using a bit 10 and an H8 because those are the two processors that may come up short on the input side more often. Uh, so if you need six channels into a bit 10 or H8, or you need eight channels into a Nove, or you need 10 channels into a bit 10, I guess, or 14 channels into a Virtuoso. And I notice here that you don't use the bit one much. Yeah, I prefer the newer technology and the newest processors, especially the Virtuoso. And I, yes. I think some people prefer the bit one from what I've heard because of the theoretical benefit of coaxial SPDIF transmission compared to optical SPDIF data transmission. It, it sounds like you have an opinion here. Me? I never have an opinion, Luca. You know that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Look, I understand that data jitter and noise on the digital data is a thing. That is absolutely true. Okay. Um, but if you're worried about bad things happening to data pulses, let's put them on copper wires and run them through the electrical environment in a car. Uh, all of us in this business know what kind of noise can be picked up by wires and cars. So I would rather have my processor and my source unit be electrically isolated from each other if I'm worried about noise and, and jitter being added to the data. Yes, and we have actually done testing here in Electromedia. And once you're in a car, we see lower level of jitter and distortion over optical than we see over coaxial. So we agree with you. All right, so now we're gonna talk about testing the wires. And mm -hmm. this measurement step confirms that we made the right choice. If it turns out that we didn't make the right choice, it, this is the time to change it at the beginning. So these three things, we will only know for certain if we test the wires. An all bit processor can handle DQing the OEM signal, and all of them can accept a DRC to handle master volume in case car has a dynamic IQ. They all will perform automatic summing to address OEM active crossovers. Now, if the OEM system has some pretty dramatic dynamic equalization, you'll wanna have a DRCMP in the system, I think, 
to give you volume control. What about DRCAB? Well, this is a point of personal preference, I guess. Um, I try to use the DRCAB with systems that require some control like switching presets. But if you have a full-time volume need, the DRCMP has a great volume knob, and, and that is my favorite way to do it. So this is what I've been calling for a long time, the three questions. Uh, these are what you have to test the wire in order to know. The first one is how many volts? Now, if you're gonna test clean voltage, you need some kind of oscilloscope. And there is one built into the bit tune and the, in, the manual for the bit tune will tell you how to do this. Uh, for simplicity in the slides, I'm showing a handheld oscilloscope. If you've never used an oscilloscope before, it's basically a cross between a voltmeter and a graphing calculator. So if you're testing for clean voltage, you need to test all along this analog signal path. Not the, the entire signal path is not part of OE integration, but I'm gonna show you the whole signal path anyway. Because at any point here, you could be clipping the signal. And if you're clipping the signal, you could have a potential problem. You can see on the, the scope here in the picture, the signal went from having that nice sine wave to being clipped off the top and the bottom. And most source units will run out of output voltage at some point. So that's a really important place to test in your signal path. You have to know what point on the volume control it's the system will start to distort. Now, there's a some people are try to tell their customer, don't ever play it above this point. And that doesn't always work. We know it doesn't always work. But you still need to know what point the distortion starts because you have to calibrate the system without distortion in it. And so it's really important for doing your DEQ step and your tuning step that you aren't clipping the system right there at the beginning of the signal chain. Now, the signal coming out of the source might not be clipping, but if you're running it into your processor and the input sensitivity of your processor is set incorrectly, or maybe the processor can't handle the voltage that's coming out of the factory system, then you're gonna get clipping happening here. And then, of course, if your amplifier is set incorrectly, you could get distortion coming out of your amplifier. Now, to take this one step farther, it is possible for you to clip your speakers. And that means your speakers are traveling farther than they're designed to. It, it might be because you have the wrong crossover points or the improper setup, or you might just be trying to do something with low performance speakers that won't do what you want them to do. Yeah, but this you can test it with the scope. No, you can't test speaker clipping with the scope. There's very advanced testing equipment that exists to do that at the manufacturing level, but we don't have that kind of equipment in car stereo. So basically you just eliminate all the other possibilities to make sure that it's really the speaker that's causing the problem. So here, if we're going to test the output of the, an amplified system, we test the preamp signal and we'll play different sine waves and we're looking for the AC voltage on the oscilloscope. If we're just gonna add a subwoofer, we use 40 or 50 Hertz sine waves, for example. Now, this analog signal is going away. It's not as popular as it used to be. So oftentimes what we end up doing is we're testing the output of the factory amplifier. Now, we talked a little bit about high voltage situations. So here is an example. Um, this is in a BMW testing the woofer output channels. And you can see on the left, the waveform is just starting to clip off the top and the bottom. And on the right, you can see we're in hard clipping. I think this is full max on the head unit. And you can see the top and the bottom of the waveform are severely clipped off. Um, I don't know if you've noticed anything odd about this measurement, so I'll tell you. The voltage is off the scale. Uh, these voltages are higher than just about any device in our industry can handle. So what do we do, Luca? Uh, well, the connection SLI do, we can handle it. That's right, it can. So now we're gonna talk about active crossovers and equalization. Now, to test for crossovers or to test for equalization, you're gonna use the same tool. You're gonna to use an audio analyzer. And again, the bit tune will do all this and the manual explains for you how to use a bit tune to do this. I'm gonna use in the slides a, an audio analyzer. Now the goal here is to make sure that you have everything you need. Now, does this signal have everything we need? Well, it looks like the base is missing. You're absolutely correct. Now, does this signal have everything we need? Well, let me see. Here, the heights are missing and half the mid-range. You are absolutely right. We need both of these signals in order to get the entire frequency range. If we're installing a full range system, we have to find both those channels. 
Now, often we will sum them together to get one full range signal. As we talked about in a few previous episodes, sometimes we don't sum them together, but we still need to know that we have found all the sounds that our system needs. Now, one time a few years back, and, and this happened lots of times, but I'm just gonna tell you one story. A customer brought his BMW into our shop and he was unhappy with the base in the system. Uh, the system was not something we installed. He had purchased it and had it installed elsewhere. So I took a real-time analyzer and plugged it into the system and determined in no time at all that there was no sub base in the <laughs> signal going to a subwoofer amp. Uh, the installing technician turned out to have connected the subwoofer amp to the signal going to the BMW rear four inch speakers in the rear deck. Now, this customer had been back three times and the specialist had not identified the problem. And, and because we had the tools and we tested, we identified it in like 60 seconds. And I wish I had fewer stories just like this one, but this is a very common error in our industry to hook things up and hope it works out, but not actually test the signals that we're using. So, oops, let's see here, I hit the wrong button. So this is testing the analog preamp output of the deck on its way to an amplifier. So these analog signals are stu still used in some cars, but they're not as common as they used to be. So occasionally you'll test one of these signals and you'll find out that the voltage doesn't change when you turn the volume up and down. So it's really important that you test by moving the volume up and down to see if that happens. Uh, one reason that you don't wanna use that signal is you probably want your volume control to work. Uh, another thing that's really important is that if the signal doesn't get affected by volume, it probably doesn't contain hands-free call audio. It probably doesn't contain uh, navigation prompts and it doesn't contain any chimes. So you're going to have to use the signal coming out of the amplifier in order to get that. And here we're testing the signal coming out of the amplifier. Now that is going to have more processing applied to it because inside the OEM amplifier is where an awful lot of processing gets applied. So if we go back to our signal path diagram for a minute, this is the signal path. And the only place that we're gonna test the output of the OEM system is right there at the beginning. Now, Sometimes when you're troubleshooting, you may test at other signal points, but for OEM integration, you only have to test at that very first point. Now, here is the very first car that I ever measured with an uh, analyzer, a 2004 Acura TSX. And you can see here, this flat signal is a, sig a signal I measured at the top of the volume control. And you can see that system puts out a perfectly flat signal. Now, interestingly, if I turn the volume control down, it gets a happy face. It, it looks like those graphic equalizers in our customers' head units, right? <laughs> so what changed? It turns out this is a feature called auto loudness. And loudness is a nickname for the Fletcher Munson loudness curve. And it describes the fact that our ears are more sensitive to bass and trouble when it's loud, and we are less sensitive to bass and trouble when it's quieter in auto loudness tries to address this change so that audio systems sound better at various volumes. So here is that flat signal that I took and here I'm gonna overlay on top of it a chart from a auto loudness preamp chip that's used in OEM head units. And you can see that top flat line matches perfectly the response that it was supposed to have. Now let's test the signal at a lower volume you can see the happy face there. And once again, you can see it perfectly matches what these preamp chips are doing. Now, the reason that I'm pointing this out and telling you this story is for one simple reason. Auto loudness describes how we hear. So if you see a reading change at high volumes and low volumes, but all that's happening is your mid range is dropping out a little bit, you don't have to worry about that being a problem because that's how humans hear. Now it's, it's not everywhere. Um, this reading here is from a 2016 Honda Civic with bass audio. You can see they definitely applied equalization to the speaker signal, but you can also see the volume 
on the left is lower and the volume on the right is higher and the signal is exactly the same. So there's no need to worry about dynamic equalization here. Now compare that to this Hyundai Tucson. On the left was a low level signal. You can see they boosted the bass a lot and they boosted the treble a lot. And on the right side is a higher volume setting signal. And you can see that it's closer to being even. Okay, it's Ken. Pretty close to auto loudness. Yeah, yeah. Ken, what did you get all these measurements? Well, I've been measuring car signals for over 15 years now. Wow. I have a lot of these screenshots <laughs> saved in different places. So, yeah. Now, if the radio you're working with has a muting protection function, you're going to need a load on those output channels. To overcome these issues and without the need of an external device, the Bit Nove, the Bit Virtuoso, and also the B10 and HADSP now have the universal speaker simulator built in and the higher end processor handle 22 volts of signal which is 50% more than 15 volts of the B10. We know some OEM amplifiers have been reaching 30 volts, as you've seen before with the BMW example, or more on the woofer channels. This is where we use a connection SLI 2.2 in front of the bit processor. Okay, so that's input channels. What about output channels? So this is where we design the system, right? Mm. And why do we design the system? to make the customer happy. We talked about this in episode one. So the system design is based on the client's desires, both the desire for performance that they have in their mind for the system they buy and the budget that they desire to give us to work with, right? Um, so the number of output channels is determined by both those things. And after we do input, then we do output, we will talk about the other things in a minute. Now, if we're on a really tight budget, we're going to try to use the bit 10. If we need a TOS link, we'll use anything but a bit 10, right? Um, if we need coaxial, we'll use a bit one. Uh, if we're going to handle high resolution all the way through, we'll use a virtuoso. And if we need a multi-channel up mixer with lots of channels passed through, we'll use a virtuoso. Yeah, hold on. You use the virtuoso also if you want the best in sound quality. If you need impulse response algorithms. A floating point DSP, audio file grade capacitor operational amps, and digital to analog converters use a virtuoso. Hold on, I got carried away. We have an entire episode on virtuoso in two weeks' time. That's okay, Luca. I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> so let's talk about system design just for just a minute or two more. That's Here cool. is an example of a really basic system. And even though it's really basic, I think this is probably the most popular design for full range systems in our industry. Uh, we have a dedicated subwoofer amp channel. And then we have left and right front channels. And there's an active crossover between the subwoofer and the front. And there's a passive crossover between the mid bass speaker and the tweeters. So we can use a bit 10 in this system because it only needs three channels. Now, if we want rear speakers, we can add two more channels for five, and we can still use a bit 10. Okay. So the bit 10 has five output channels. That's enough. And everything else has more. So this basic system, you can use any DSP in the bit line. So here is an example of a system like that. Uh, this is a bit 10 feeding a four channel amp in the SR line, the 4.500. And that is powering the APK 165P component set in the front using the passive crossovers. You can even see they're in the diagram. Mm -hmm. And then we've bridged three and four to a single 10 inch subwoofer that is four ohm, the 10 S4S. So here's the Hertz version of this same, and I, I venture to guess this is a pretty commonly installed system at specialist dealers. Here's a version of that in the Hertz line. You can see that we've got the ML Power 5, I'm sorry, the ML Power 4, being bridged, uh, the H8 DSP going into the ML Power 4. Then we've got a MIE Pro 10 inch sub and MIE Pro components using the passive crossovers. So the fronts are getting 150 watts per channel in this situation, mm -hmm. and the subwoofer is getting 500 watts. So both these systems, I think, are really cool, simple three channel upgrades. Mm -hmm. Yes, hold on, Ken. Uh, question for you. I heard people say that if you're going passive, on the Twitter, you get no benefit from a DSP. 
oh my gosh, that's not actually correct. Mm -hmm. So remember, we're trying to address the three problems of car stereo and we're trying to make the system sound good, right? Those are the mm -hmm. two goals that we might have. So the bit processor will give us level and EQ to address the first two problems of stereo, which are one side is louder, one side sounds different. So we can handle that. And we can also use level and EQ to make the overall sound as good as possible, even if there's a passive crossover. Okay. And as far as the third problem, that's one side arriving first, I'm often asked, how do you set distance in these passive systems during the tune? Well, you're always going to use the distance to the largest speaker on that channel and enter that distance into your bit processor. You may remember this chart from previous episodes. This describes the cancellation problems that we solve with delay. And you'll notice the problems are bigger in the lower frequencies and they get smaller as we go higher. And above a certain point, we just stop worrying about them, right? So the bigger problems are solved by measuring to the largest speaker on the channel. So that's true if you have a six in a tweeter. It's true if you have a four in a tweeter. It's true if you have a three in a tweeter. Now, if you measure somewhere in between the mid and the tweeter, or if you measure to both and then take the average, or if you just measure to the tweeter, if there's a mid-range connected on the same channel, you will not be addressing the biggest problems on the chart. Now, here's a version of that two-way passive front system, but we added rear speakers. We're using Prima 6.5 coaxials. And so we can power the rears. We've upgraded the amplifier to the SR5 channel amplifier. Uh, now this system has 75 watts by four and 550 watts to the sub. The bit 10 still has enough output channels to support this system. And this is probably the most popular five channel amp system in our industry, front components, rear coaxes, and a sub. And, and here's the Hertz version of that same five channel system with an ML power five and a an H8 DSP. Now let's upgrade this system and let's use five channels that are fully active. And this is something, a system design that's really popular at a lot of specialists. You use a pair of amp channels just for the tweeters. And you use a pair of amp channels just for the mid-range or the mid-bass speaker. And then you use a channel for the sub. Now you've eliminated the passive crossovers on the tweeters. You get direct control over tweeter level. You get direct control over tweeter crossover slope and, and uh, crossover point and you can tune it a lot more. So here, 75 watts by four, 550 to the sub, and we've maxed out the number of outputs coming out of the bit 10. We've used all five. Now, it works great, as long as you don't add rear speakers to your requirements. If you add rear speakers to the requirements, you're gonna have to step up to the H8 or the bit Nove, and you're also going to need more amplifier channels. Um, Here's the Hertz version using Mie Pro and a Mie Power amplifier without rears. Now here's an upgraded Audison version. This uses a bit Nove, and we're going into an amplifier we haven't talked about before. This is the Voce AV5.1K amplifier. And it's an amp I wish more people knew about. Yeah. It has channels that are optimized for the tweeters and then optimized for the mid ranges and then optimized for subwoofers. And it's intended specifically for these three-way active systems that we're talking about. So here, by using the Nove rather than the bit 10, we get parametric equalization. So it's an upgrade, even though we're still only using five channels of output. Yeah, and since uh, this series has been focused on OEM integration, we have not talked about the AV 5.1K before. And this is an amazing hybrid amplifier with class A channels for highs or mid heights, class AB for mid range or mid bass, and class D for the subwoofer. It really uses the best amplifier technology for each of these frequency bands. So here in this scenario, we're using that same amplifier, but we're using Toslink going into the Nove. And that could be from a bit DMI or a C2O or a Toslink output head unit or some other device. And now we've upgraded from a Nove to a Virtuoso. And this has a lot of analog inputs that we could use. It also has more powerful parametric equalization. We can do a lot more fine tuning using a Virtuoso. 
and we could use one or both of the Toslink inputs. Now, the Toslink inputs on the Virtuoso are capable of handling 20, uh, 96 kilohertz signals with 24 bits of depth. And remember, when you interface with the Toslink input with the Virtuoso, you can use full DA technology and exclusive to Audison technology to connect the Virtuoso to the AV 5.1K HD. Now you will have a digital signal traveling from the source all the way to the amplifier at high res resolution, at high res native resolution, I would say. You can do this with Voce and Thesis amplifiers. Now, when we use Toslink, it's important for you to remember, the original Toslink spec did not support volume control. Uh, that was always supposed to be handled by a downstream preamp. Now, some devices support volume over the spit of stream nowadays, and some don't. So if you're using Toslink, you may need a DRC to control volume. Um, also, SPDIF does not support front-to-rear fade. So if you need front-to-rear fade in your system, the DRC can do that for you also. Now, here is a five-channel, four-way system without rears. Uh, we're using a passive crossover from the mid to tweeter. And then we're using an active crossover from the mid to mid base. Um, this is most easily done with a five channel amp, but you can do it with a four channel amp and a subwoofer as well. And here is an example where we're using a SR 5.600 amp and the Prima APK163 three-way component set. Now we are not using the crossover that came in that set for the mid base. We're giving the mid base its own dedicated amplifier channel, and we're doing that actively in the processor. Now, getting rid of the mid base passive crossovers eliminates the inductor coils that are inside there. And they're the biggest inductor coils in the crossover kit because it's the lowest crossover frequency that would be used. So we're making the biggest difference by getting rid of the biggest inductors. Now, we still use the included passive crossovers on the 4-inch mid and the tweeter because they're a lot smaller. And then you can see the subwoofer here is an APS-10D. So here's the same system with a Nove processor and a 5.1K amplifier, and we've stepped up to Voce speaker components. So we're still using a passive crossover between the mid and the tweeter. It's the CX. 2WMH, which is specifically made for this application. And then we're fully active on the mid base crossovers. And in the Hertz version of this, you can see that we've got a four-way system, MIE Power 5, and the, in both of these systems, you're going to measure the distance to the biggest speaker on the mid tweeter channel, which is going to be the three inch mid range, and enter that into the bit processor. So we talked about how on these systems, we got rid of the big inductors. That's much more beneficial than worrying about the inductors in series on the tweeter. Now, the second thing is when we lower, we, we get rid of the lower passive crossover and we go active, we get more benefit from using delay, especially when we're trying to integrate it with the bottom end of the mid range and the top end of the subwoofer. Now here's a big system. I just put this one together. It's got three amplifiers. It's got front two-way active. It's got rears. We bridged an ML Power 4 for the mid base. That's a pretty big system, but let's look at full-on four-way fully active systems for a minute. Now, even without rears, you can't do this system with a bit 10. There's just not enough outputs on a bit 10. Now, let's see. Now we can power larger systems with the H8, no problem. Now here, this is a four-way fully active multi-channel system with active three-ways in the front, active three-ways in the rear, a two-way active center, and a subwoofer. And this is basically the premium Meridian systems in the Range Rovers and the Jaguars. And when you run into a car that has this many channels and this many speakers from the factory, you're going to want to decide how many of them you're actually upgrading. Now, let me explain that a little bit. Um, if you leave the three-way actives in the rear doors out of your upgrade plan, you can then use a single Virtuoso and grab every channel you need in the car. And that's a pretty smart play. Um, you do get less benefit from upgrading the rear door speakers than you get from any other speaker channel in the car. Now, if you need to upgrade those as well to get maximum volume from the system, you will either need to use two Virtuosos or an easier way to do it would be to use a Prima bit amplifier just on the rear doors. 
Now, here is an example of an upmixed pass-through system. This is kind of a medium power system in that we're using two 4.300 four-channel amps and a 5.600 five-channel amp. So if you add that up, it's 75 watts by 12 channels and then 550 watts to the subwoofer. Now, maybe you want more power than that. So here is an SR amplifier system with three 4.500s and a 1.500 subwoofer amp. This system is 130 watts by 12 channels, and it's 1,000 watts to the subwoofer. So both of these are great upmixer retention systems, and obviously you can go farther by using amps higher up on the Audison line like the Voce or the Thesis. Now, this is what you could do in a BMW that had Logic 7 upmixing, for example. You can see that we've added the SLI 2.2 on the woofer channels because we know those are reaching high voltages. So we've talked about the input side and we've talked about the output side. Let's talk for just a minute about the third point. Uh, other. other? What do you mean by other? Well, let me show you really quickly. Um, obviously the first one is, do you need a DRC? Hmm. If you need it, it's easy. All the bit processors support the DRC. Now, what if you need Toslink? Hmm. That's pretty easy. Like the bit 10 doesn't have Toslink in. The bit 10D had Toslink in, but that is not in production going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What if you need two Toslinks? Mm -hmm. Well, there's two Toslinks in the Nove and the Virtuoso. That lets you use a bit DMI alongside a high res player or a C2O converter if you want. Or a, or a PlayStation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so now here's the bit one and the bit Virtuoso offer you variable equalization. Why do you have variable equalization? Maybe you want to do your own auto loudness adjustment, but it basically will work. You set a low level EQ and a high level EQ. Mm -hmm. And if you turn the knob on the, the um, DRC, the equalization will progress from one extreme to the other. But it works best when you use the DRC as a volume control. Now, do you need parametric equalization? Oh, I yes. Think so. I think everybody needs parametric equalization. It's my we favorite. Love parametric equalization. <laughs> now, what about pass through mode? Now, mm. pass through mode lets you run 12 channels through without summing them, and you can still mm. equalize them. And mm. if you need it, the Virtuoso is the only one that has it. It's also the only one that gives you manual input equalization of each of the various inputs. And it's the only one that gives you a global tuning equalizer. What that means is you can tune each of your individual equalizers to get left and right to match. And then when you tune the overall system, you have another equalizer that you can use. Now, as we talked about in previous episodes, they're starting to use phase processing in OEM systems. And if you want to undo it, you're going to want a Virtuoso that has all pass filter correction built into it. Yeah, yeah. And the Bit Virtuoso has a high resolution support all the way through. So if you have a virtual thesis amps, you can play up to 60 kilohertz or even higher. This is the processor you need. And the Bit Virtuoso, again, is the best sounding automotive DSP processor in the world. The Bit Virtuoso Audison uses the most popular DSP chip in studio grade equipment used by professionals around the world. A floating point architecture allows you more precision and dramatically reduces noise and quantization errors. This is very common in recording studio equipment, but rare in car audio. It has FIR mode, which allows manipulation of the signal without introducing phase side effects. It has audiophile parts, capacitor, resistors, operational amps in the circuits. But I won't go into the Virtuoso in detail until the next episode, but we firmly believe it's the best in the world. So here's the three-step process. You make sure you have enough inputs. You make sure you have enough outputs. And you check to see what other features or performance capabilities are required by the system. Mm -hmm. So let's go over the bit line really quickly one more time. We've got the bit 10, four channels in, five channels out, summing DEQ. We've got the H8, four channels in, eight channels out, and Toslink. We've got the bit, the classic bit one, eight in, eight out, spit of coaxial and uh, 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 to Toslink. It uses a floating point DSP and it supports full DA. Now the bit Nove from the new parametric generation 
has six channels in and nine channels out. It has two Toslinks and like I and it has USS speaker loading built in. Now, finally, the flagship bit virtuoso, 12 channels in, 13 channels out, USS speaker loading built in, phase and time correction. Two Toslink inputs, high resolution, full DA, and very flexible group and global parametric equalizers. Yes, yes. And um, the next episode will be focused and dedicated to this uh, beautiful uh, machine. And uh, Audison offers a wide range of solutions, allowing you, as we talked about in the episode one, to select one to have an happy customer and a successful plan. Well, that was a lot of information, guys. I want to thank you for sticking through it. I mean it. And I'm quite sure now you know how to choose the right ESP. Do you want me to back up? We can do it again. No, 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 no. Let's see if they have questions. So to the attendees, please use the Q&A function. And sorry to insist on this point, but if you use the chat, it's going to be erased while the Q&A remain in our files. So we might follow up uh, even later. Let's have a look. All right. Oh, so there's Jimmy. Can I add one more? That's key. Jimmy Bradfield was asking earlier that can I add one more? That's key. Maximize performance of the amplifiers and speakers. But yeah, Jimmy, that we, actually, we actually talked about this a little bit uh, when we were writing uh, this this episode. And um, first of all, we are assuming you started with Audison amplifiers and speakers, so we, we you've done that. Um, but seriously, the, when you are correcting the performance of the speaker in the car, you can't tell the difference between the shortcomings of the speaker and the shortcomings of the location. It's kind of like room, um, uh, uh, room optimization, uh, algorithms for home audio. They can't tell either. So you'll be doing both at the same time. You're absolutely right. So does Holger saying, how do you kind count the eight inputs in the bit one? Mm. I, I, I don't know if I've used a, a, a bit one in, in a while, so. Okay. So we'll get back to Oigar surely with a detailed reply on this. Uh, Diego, buenas tardes, Diego. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo puedo controlar el ISS o ruido de piso en un bit 10 conectado a radio OEM? Diego is asking cómo, yes, cómo se puede, cómo, how you can eliminate uh, brand ground. Uh, muy poco y muy mal. But I think what you're talking about is background noise when you run a factory radio into a bit 10. And there are a couple of situations that can cause background noise. One of them is if you need full-time load resistors on certain head units. I know this has happened with Toyota. Another one is if you are using a very, very low level signal and you have to test the voltage to see if it is very low in voltage. If it is very low in voltage, like a preamp signal, you may need to run it into the aux input of the bit 10 instead of the speaker input of the bit 10. Um, but we would really need to talk offline about exactly which car you were having the problem with, because I don't think it's something you run into with every car. Okay, guys, more questions. Uh, Billy, a uh, question about the crossover and amp setting, or crossover and gain settings. Um, my answer is don't use the crossovers in the amplifier when you're setting your bit one turn it off and uh, just use the crossovers in the bit processor. There are installers out there who one time early in the history of DSP had a DSP forget what the crossovers were. And so now they turn on the crossovers in the amplifier every single time. Mm -hmm. that, those are trust issues. Don't do that. Um, if you want to be certain, use a series capacitor on your tweeter on an active tweeter system so you don't blow up the tweeter, but you don't need to use the crossovers in the amp. Now setting gains, quite honestly, we could have an entire episode just on setting gains, but whenever you're setting gains, you do wanna match the input sensitivity of the processor to the signal that you have. And the bit one actually has a wizard to walk you through doing that with the included CD, right, Luca? Yep, 
Yeah, exactly. Then we have uh, Scott Harrell asking, what is the difference in the Bit1 HD versus the Virtuoso? I can reply this because I had, a, as you know, can uh, an intense session with our DSP guys. <laughs> so basically the functionalities of, uh, um, of the two processors are the same. There have been um, hardware improvement and some uh, uh, extra plugs uh, in order to interface it with uh, new equipments. But uh, from uh, basically from a uh, functionality's point of view, both on the IIR and FIR function, it's just the same. When the Bit1 HD was introduced, it didn't have some of the functionality that was added with software version 2.0, which works in the original Bit1 hardware but it also works in the Virtuoso 2.0 and, and beyond. I think H, Bit1 HD didn't have USS speaker loading either. Mm, possibly, I'm not sure about it, but possibly, yes. And then, Olga, um, which crossover did you use in the Hertz example with the four-way system, six channels? The passive crossover was the one that came with the component, the Hertz component set. Um, come on, guys. I we here for a few more minutes. I don't know if it's uh, the case. To here we go. Thanks from the oh. thank you, Olga, for your great attendance and attention. I get back to you on the beat one. Don't worry. Okay, we have no questions in the chat, so I think it looks like we've covered yes. everything Is yes there a, and uh, anybody else has one before we before we go home for the day uh, jimmy say great job splitting the spm4 everyone should have them in stock yes i was thinking that exact thing i should have put that in there Every, <laughs> if you cannot use the spm4 if you didn't order it and have it ready yes and it Good saves point. and it save and it's a parachute sometimes right ken yes it is Yes, <laughs> that's what it is. Okay, so if you want to put up the slide with the, we have a support. Uh, can we? You can rely on, and it. You can write to us anytime. So um, it is uh, the, the mail. It is support at electromedia.it, and can if you can show it uh, on the screen. And uh, we're always available here for any question, uh, meanwhile, from uh, one episode to the other. But uh, before leaving, before leaving, uh, let me let me tell you what is going to be the next episode. And as we repeated several times, even if we tried <laughs> introducing <laughs> the Bit1 HD Virtuoso, or the Virtuoso, better said, uh, episode six is all, all about Virtuoso. And we will focus on how to use at its best the most advanced OEM integration processor in the market. So it's all for today. Ciao, everybody, as we say in Italy. See you on the 25th of November for the last episode. It's going to be a blast. Enjoy. Two weeks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.